Good afternoon and welcome to the October 13, 2015 meeting of the Nantucket Memorial Airport Commission. Henceforth, we have an announcement section at the beginning of the, uh, of the agenda. And the first announcement and the perpetual announcement that is that this meeting is both being both audio and video recorded. Uh, are there any other announcements? Um, moving on, uh, are there any comments on the agenda? Hearing none is adopted. Uh, the minutes of September 8th, are there any additions or corrections? I move approval. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, the uh, warrant of 923 and 107. Is there a motion to ratify those warrants? I make that motion. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. It's unanimous. Is there public comment at this time? Hearing none, uh, we will move on to our master plan and sustainability program update. Mr. Rafter? The master plan is complete. <laughs> and the airport layout plan has been approved by the FAA. There's, in fact, one minor update, even subsequent to the signatures. Um, there was a modification to standards that was pending on the airport layout plan for the runway safety area uh, for the runway six approach. And that has been approved, so it's no longer pending. So that's good news. The FAA has already approved that. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to um, Bill Richardson from Jacobs to take us through the basics of the, uh, the plan itself and the ALP. Welcome, Mr. Richardson. <coughs> Thank you, Dan, Tom, and commissioners. Uh, Bill Richardson from Jacobs, the, uh, I guess, project manager for the master plan. Um, tonight, I thought we'd quickly go through um, the key elements of, of where, what the master plan is, what the final approved components are, the first being the approved airport layout plan, or ALP as we call it. As Tom mentioned, um, the FAA has signed it. Uh, you all have eight small copies, I guess, of it in front of you. And the little teeny block down in the lower left corner, um, just above Tom's signature, uh, has something illegible in there that says pending FAA approval, and that is what FAA has just approved. So um, that letter came from FAA just last week. If, if I may, Bill, too, I'll, I'll caution the commissioners just like I do with the entire staff. Whenever you're looking at the airport layout plan, <clears throat> there's two things you have to remember. One, make sure you're looking at the fully executed, that all the signatures are there. And two, there's <coughs> a compatible document that is a written letter that has all the conditions associated with it. Correct. Um, this plan actually uh, set the stage then for discussions with the FAA just in the last week or so for the capital improvement plan, which sets the priorities for FAA's funding for major projects and improvements over the next five to ten years. Uh, that CIP is related to the elements on this ALP, which in turn is tied back into the master plan. And for members of the working group who were here when we did the priority rankings, um, those priorities fell into four basic categories, safety and security improvements, efficiency and revenue enhancements, capacity enhancements, and environmental initiatives. And I thought I'd just quickly go through each of those four categories and pick out the specific areas on this ALP document that relate to those four categories. So the first one uh, shows the ALP. These are the signature blocks here with Tom and Dan and the FAA and the state and yours truly. Uh, so that's what you need to look for when you're comparing this document to anything else. What this plan shows is basically the airport layout with the 624 and 1533 and 1230, the main runways the terminal building, the aprons, and then these areas around the periphery. Actually, this is all airport property. And these shaded in areas are potential surplus parcels um, that have no real aeronautical use, but are available to the commission for lease or sale, uh, conversion, and are the biggest 
potential source of future revenue generation for the airport and or environmental mitigation uh, as projects move forward. Uh, the next slide shows the first of the, or all four of the categories again that <laughs> relate to the ALP CIP improvements, which again from the master plan had the four safety improvements, safety and security, efficiency, revenue, capacity, and environmental sustainability. And I'll go through each of the primary uh, priorities that came out of the um, the CIP and master plan process. So the next slide, I think, will start the safety and security improvements. And the first safety and security is ongoing. Actually, we are in the process of reconstructing existing terminal pavement around the main terminal building. We've started this area one, currently under, or recently completed, I guess. Um, and then we'll go sequentially. These numbers will probably be reordered um, as we move through, just so that we can get the entire commercial site ramp, or the, the secure ramp first, and then move around the and and so further south. The importance of this is you can do all of these projects without having to get environmental permits. Anytime you touch new ground, virgin ground, you're going to need to go through permitting for all of the projects within the next five to ten years that could impact new surface. So we're trying to defer the fairly expensive permitting costs until later. The next slide shows a current initiative and that is to upgrade the flight, in flight information displays or the FIDs again for safety and security so that it, this is an example of what you got now and we want it to be more interactive and so that the PA announcements are adequate for handicapped people um, and or hearing impaired. Uh, so that's a both a safety and a security related issue related to public safety. The next one is for the staff and for summer employees, the interactive training program that AAAE puts out. This is a modular, modularized um, syllabus where the individual sits down and actually goes through and selects individual screens, uh, answers the questions, the test is then graded, and given the number of employees that you have coming through, sometimes changing on a bi-weekly basis, uh, <laughs> that have to be uh, tested for site access, it's critical. Made, this has become very important this past season. We had a very high turnover rate. Uh, one particular airline was sending us new employees on a weekly basis. And it's very, very time consuming. This standardizes it and frees up some of the time for staff too. Yes. And this is FAA eligible for, for ninety percent reimbursement. So it's it's a very important system. It's very it's similar to all the other big airports. Logan has it. I've got a badge somewhere that as well as Worcester. So it's it's you're running with the tall dogs now. And it's a vitally important piece. Next one is the safety improvement which is the offsets for taxiway golf and echo right now they are substan they're too close for the wingspans of opposing e-190s for example um, they physically can get by if the crew stops and goes very slowly uh, but they don't meet the FAA standard so what would happen is we would take pavement off the inside of golf and add it to the outside and shift the center line so that the two center lines are 152 feet apart. But in doing that, FAA is going to require not only golf but echo because we're going to be touching echo further down to go through an upgrade all the way down to the south end. That means environmental permitting. That's when the environmental permits will kick in, not only for this, but others as well. The next one is the uh, South Apron. This is longer term. There, it's broken into at least five, one, two, three, four, five phases. Um, attached to it is a noise barrier, a wall that would be built along with each phase as it extends to the south. Um, and again, the permitting for that would be triggered to go along with the permitting all at once. You would comp you'd get comprehensive permits for all of the projects that are going to be done in the next five years for efficiency's sake. 
but this is a this is an existing issue right now where the wingtip clearance on the taxi lanes here are much too tight for the new fleet of corporate jets that are coming into service and it puts the airport um, at an increased risk of liability issues with taxing aircraft through those constrained spaces. Uh, the next one is an operational safety. Right now, jets have to run the entire length when they're landing on 2-4, come all the way down to the end of 6, and then back taxi going uphill so there's a bit of power and additional fuel and fumes and exhaust. If we can get them off here with a what they call a high speed or 45 degree angle exit and then turn and come back, that would save an immense amount of time uh, and reduce the noise and pollution and fuel burn. And it's something that the tower had re has been requesting for quite a while. Toppy's been most anxious to get this put in. And again, because it's new pavement in new areas, it would require environmental permitting as part of that comprehensive permit. Next one is the long-term improvements here and at the end of 3-3, and again, the insets here reflect what are on the ALP. FAA is very interested in getting rid of this little blob of pavement, which is the old run-up area. It's actually inside the safety area for 3-3 three, three approaches, so it's not a good idea to keep them there. And they'd like to move them outboard out here and then come into the end of 3-3, three, three, so there's a full-length takeoff run available when the winds are northwest. Uh, similarly, when you're landing 3-3, you've got to go all the way to the end, or with 2-4 operations crossing, you have to hold short at a point here, which means nobody else can land on 3-3, which is a preferred overwater noise abatement approach. So if we can get aircraft off and holding up here with this exit taxiway, you can get two or three 402s holding up here, having made the overwater approach, and then all cross at once on Alpha and into the terminal. Uh, this may be an issue with FAA given their midfield crossing, but since you already have a midfield crossing at Charlie down here, which was held to be acceptable um, under a prior SRMP or safety risk management panel that we went through with FAA, uh, they felt that this would not uh, make this issue any, any worse because basically the same traffic would be coming over in here. And it's right under the tower, so it's the safest possible spot for it to continue. So those are long-term airfield safety improvements, all of which would have to be part of that eventual permitting process. The next slide, I think, gets into the efficiency and revenue enhancements. And again, non-aviation surplus parcels are the key. Um, you can sell, swap, or lease them. The first one is, is going to be, hopefully, um, up off Nobidier Farm for essential emergency personnel, uh, both airport and community employees, summer employees. Uh, but long term, uh, we're looking, or actually short term, we're looking at enhancing aviation revenue sources as well as airfield revenue sources. PB Aviation, our aviation financial subconsultant, just did a benchmarking study of comparable uh, resort destination airports and made recommendations to bring Nantucket up on a par to those other airports. Um, and that then triggers an equitable restructuring of rates and charges. Uh, and we've identified the potential for a number of GA hangars and potential commercial combo space, which on your ALP shows up at the, as these little dark gray appendages that are off to the side. Those would be privately funded, privately developed, and privately <coughs> permitted. The next one is what your short-term best options are, and that is to look at the Sun Island parcels. The key here is that these parcels are not identified as part of the state's environmental endangered species program, Dragnet, which covers the whole island, uh, except for the Sun Island parcels. So these could be leased or sold for uh, revenue enhancing development um, fairly quickly. The housing, however, is part of the um, endangered species area and they would have to be walked over and the 
habitat looked at um, and negotiations started with the environmental or with the Endangered Species Act management people uh, to put that in contact with what else might be happening in the future. But this is your first big potential in terms of revenue enhancement. The next one um, is capacity in improvements. And the terminal, as we all know, during the summer has hot spots. The, the hold rooms get overcrowded uh, when you have multiple flights departing uh, and being screened to go to either Logan or GFK or any place else, hopefully in the future, that need to be screened. This backs up. This is a floor plan of the terminal building. Uh, these are the check-in desks. This is the secure. Uh, this is the TSA screening area, and this is the hold room. It's undersized by about half, and that causes people to back out and queue into the corridors, which is a safety, uh, really a fire code issue. Um, the short-term option is to look at reinstalling your seasonal tent structure, which you use during the construction of the, of the terminal building. It would fit right where it used to be, um, and it would be accessed through the pre-screened uh, vestibule here so that people could wait out there. Uh, the next one is a, another airfield capacity. A lot of times departures here will be cleared from the gate. Uh, they'll taxi out, but then they can't get cleared to land downstream at either New York or elsewhere because of ground stops. So they need another area for holding those departing aircraft. And these two bypass stub taxiways could, could fit the bill. Most airports have these. these. These are standard sort of things. But again, new construction, long term, still permitted in, in the comprehensive EA, EIR that would have to happen in a couple of years. Don't Go ahead. Hold, don't they hold IFR departures uh, Yeah, but it, they try to, but the problem is if there's a delay at the gate, they've got to, they've got to leave for the next guy to come in, uh, and there's not always room. Uh, Mr. Buscarin, would you oh. ask the chair for permission to speak, oh. please? <laughs> yes, sir, do you have a question? I was just going to make a comment on what happened this summer. Okay, go ahead. All right. Joe Rose, Director of Operations with Island Airlines. This summer, they introduced time-based metering to Nantucket, well, the whole Cape area. And because of the way time-based metering works, very often you start taxing out, you don't get your metering delay until after you leave the gate. And that's become a major problem. Thank you, Mr. Rose. The next one is shifting, again, to the final issue, which is the environmental initiatives and, and environmental state sustainability, as I mentioned. In two or three years, we'll have to look at a comprehensive EA, EIR, environmental assessment, environmental impact report for any new or expanded airport pavement <coughs> projects. Um, and that is basically driven by a botanical master plan. Uh, and the idea is to do it all at once rather than project by project. Uh, that then gives you a clean bill of health for the next five to ten years. And the environmental agencies know where you're coming from. And the FAA is happy because they know that you've got all the permits and you can just keep going project by project by project and follow the CIP. But that doesn't kick in for a couple of years because we want to focus on getting existing pavements, everything we've got basically brought up to standard first. I think the next one goes through some of the other environmental initiatives. This is again the noise barrier which runs all along the south apron. Uh, unfortunately the FAA decided that's not AIP eligible, but I think we might still fight that because it does have significant benefit for ground noise. Um, but again, it would be built as part of each successive phase of the uh, South Apron extension. Next one is actually the flight tracks. We're going to continue the, uh, the flight track initiative, um, the voluntary noise abatement procedure is typically what it is. Um, this is unlike any other airport. It, in that it does not follow the standard FAA VFR racetrack flight tracks, which typically would concentrate all of the traffic right over downtown in a, a little uh, sort of rectangular flight pattern. Um, but basically these tracks 
although still are causing some issues. When, when we did the noise analysis, we found out, and you can go into the, the master plan and look at the details, but the, the bottom line is that the, the critical noise contour stays within the airport boundaries, which is the 65 DNL. Um, and that really was part of the FAA's resistance to funding the noise wall. Um, but the, over the last 20 years or 15 years that the flight track program has been in place, it's caused another million gallons of fuel to be burned. It's, it's generated 478 metric tons of carbon per year, and it's cost about $5 million in fuel to, to implement this. But the benefits on the next slide are fairly significant in that the noise contours have shrunk down to where they're in this purple, which again, this is the 65 annual LDN, which is FAA standard, and it's all within the airport boundary. Um, the next slide, I think, is basically the end, and <laughs> unless there are any other questions, the last slide, I think, is just the happy slide, yeah. Um, Noah has put us on Facebook, and we've got a, a Twitter thing, and um, we're on the website. So thank you for the last two or three years. <laughs> Interesting project. Um, we think it's done. FAA has finally signed the last little thing. Um, but the CIP, again, is an annual process, and it gets updated each year with FAA. Um, and whatever the current priorities are, you can introduce at that time. So Later in the agenda, too, I have a... Uh, we'll be discussing the CIP and I'll update you on our meeting with the FAA about that. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Richardson at this point? I have some questions. I don't know. Uh, Mr. Richardson, sure. you mentioned that you have hearing impaired and all. Do you have sight impaired? Have you that, considered that? If I that, may. I'm, go ahead. Yes. The, the, the system that we have, first, there's two systems and they're not integrated. We're going to do that. The hearing is the PA. The sight is, are the boards so that you'll be able to put up uh, announcements and things. If there's a PA announcement, it can come up on the board for those that are uh, hearing impaired as well. Okay. I think one thing we have to be aware of, but having had uh, a sight impaired person on our Commission for Disability, there's lots of areas where they like the yellow line or something that delineates, and I don't know whether that's something you've considered or not. Um, then the other question, you mentioned South Apron. Is that a long term when you're going to start on that, or is that something sooner? That would be a... Uh, based on the priorities of what FAA wants to fund, they, they want to fund the ge what they call the geometry issues with the taxiways first. Mm -hmm. uh, part of the strategy in pushing off the environmental for a couple of years is to hopefully, on a national level, have some comment and feedback to FAA on their geometry issues. I think Toppy is aware of some of these stub taxiway issues, for example, where they want to shift them off center line. So if we wait for that to go, then we can do the environmental, then we would get to the South Apron extensions. Okay, and one more, well, actually two more questions. The size of the parcels on Sun Island, you were talking about housing and everything else. How many houses do you figure that would go in? Or is it a big oh. unit you're think, thinking about? Or have you even thought about that? We haven't even thought about it. It's, okay. it's at the conceptual stage right now, but I assume it would be similar to the ones next door. They're kind of multifamily units um, okay. and employee housing. Um, not and dormitories, I'm, but something better than dormitories, okay. I would assume. I'm not familiar with the tent that was used for the TSA previously. Is that weatherproof and, and all <laughs> or not? I mean, in Nantucket, and we, you know, this morning getting all that rain, would everything yep. been torrential there? Um, it probably wouldn't stand up to Hurricane Sandy, no, but um, it, it's better than the congestion sturdy. issue. It's remarkably sturdy. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. That's my question. Thank, Thank you very you, much. Thank you. Appreciate it, Mr. Richardson. Thank you. Anything else? Any comments or questions from the public? Um, I would l like to uh, thank uh, Mr. Richardson and the staff of Jacobs for their work on the master plan and getting us to this point. It took a little while, but it got done. And um, I think we have a document that we can work with. I would also like to thank the advisory committee. Yes, thank members you. were invited to attend today, uh, but chose not to. 
and they sat through several meetings uh, where their input was was received and considered and incorporated in some cases in this and um, they were a very useful group and we appreciate their service um, do they get a copy of this yes there are extra copies but here do we have and well, we they're ready see. for mailing out to the working group okay and all of this is on the website now too it will be all right now that it seems to be final <laughs> we think <laughs> Based right. on FAA. Thank you very much. Thank you now. Yeah. All right. We move on to pending matters, the formerly used defense site. I'm going to take advantage of Noah's uh, attendance and ask him to give us a brief update on the uh, formerly used defense site. He's been working closely with Army Corps on this issue. Thank you, Mr. Carberg. Uh, Noah Carberg, environmental coordinator. As you'll recall, in the bunker area, we have what's known as a MRS, munitions response site, that the Army Corps is undertaking a remedial investigation of. Um, associated with that, we did move some material from that site to the runway 24 approach. There are a lot of questions about that. The Army Corps graciously, when they're here at the beginning of November, they'll be screening that pile as well, which That's is very good news. of a great benefit to the airport. So work scheduled to start on that. In November, it's going to involve some geophysical work, some soil sampling, some screening, and that data really forms the basis for what happens next. So it's a little bit of a sort of a black hole yet to be determined what's going to happen. But, but do, we, do you know how long that process is going to take? Uh, to the clarify, first the, yeah. the first step, uh, it should be completed beginning and ending within the month of November. Great. It's progress. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Carberg? All right. Uh, anything on the general fund repayment proposal? No change. Nothing, no information there. Thank you. All right. The voluntary noise abatement program update. This is on the agenda because when we discussed this, I believe back in June, and had a he public hearing on the on the uh, um, on some proposed uh, changes to the single engine rules related to the voluntary noise abatement program. Uh, we decided to see how those were, the changes that were implemented, how they went, uh, what the public reaction was to them, and um, make a decision now as to whether to keep them in place or revert. And uh, so, Mr. Carberg, do your best. Oh, well, summarize, I can even skip my first slide. No. <laughs> um, brought about, be a there's a high cost of voluntary route compliance for single engine aircraft with the FAA single engine glide slope criteria. Uh, I worked with Joe Rose at Island Airline. This is the runway 24 departure route for the single engine that complies with both the noise abatement guidelines and the FAA glide slope criteria. Uh, I showed this chart a few months ago. I don't want to dwell too far on it, but this is the approximate flight time for the normal route and this is the flight time for this route. Uh, talk to, talking to Joe, everything is categorized by time, fuel, maintenance costs. It basically, it ends up being an expensive trip for Island Air, and it takes a long time. It's fewer flights. It's fewer people that come through the airport. So we were asked to... I'll go to the next slide, please, Dave. So we were asked to suggest some potential solutions or other workarounds, and the one we really settled on was this left hook turn back up above the airport, staying within compliance guidelines. It's that original, um, original amount of time and to uh, trial it for the summer period. So next slide. So what we're doing anyway as part of our landing fee incentive program is we're auditing VFR flight tracks. And here are the results for Island Air's VFR flight tracks that I audited from June through September. See, I audited 265 flights, found 231 of them to be compliant, 87% success rate total. You can see that for June, July, August, and September, Island Air was meeting or exceeding the compliance threshold of 85%. Uh, typically, 53% uh, of our departures occur from runway 24 in the summer. South winds dominate, traffic dominates, that's why this departure dominates. 
I wanted to ask and answer the question, is this single engine route really necessary? Could a carrier spend their 15% allowance flying non-compliant on runway 24 departures? So next slide. Using the same Island Air numbers, for example, I went back and I broke out Island Air's operations by each arrival and departure. So for runway 24 departures, for the caravan only, they're still operating one or two 402s? One? Yeah, one at a time. No. Spares are being shorter like they're on stage. So I pulled the 402 operations out of this. And basically for the runway 24 departure, that's 14.3% of their operations in June. I called that an effective limit. One more, they would have been bust over 15%. July and August, that departure was 19 and 23 percent of their operations. That's a bust. September, uh, Islander would have started at 63 out of 71. They would have been able to fly three non-compliant flights otherwise, and still be under compliance. Uh, so, my opinion, my opinion only. Yes, I think this route is option for Islander. Next slide. I also wanted to just look at some hypotheticals for our other two enrollees in the program. I made some Cape Air assumptions. Um, can always change out these with other assumptions, changes, but let's just assume Cape Air went through a partial fleet changeover to include a single engine at the same relative portion of single engine runway 24 departures as Island Air. Just. And let's just say 50% of those hypothetical single engine departures are non-compliant, not 100. Why? Well, because there's a White Plains component, Providence component, and it's EWB is that New Bedford? Yes. Yeah. Th that can go either way. It can sometimes go over the top. It can sometimes go out west. So next slide. Again, these are Cape Air's actual audit numbers from... Um, um, da, da, da. Yeah, that seems I, I that seems low, but actually I think that's right. Well, anyway, so you can see Cape Air was running 85, 93, 98, 92 percent compliance, and then just I won't go all the way through the chart, but throwing forward those assumptions and correcting their <laughs> departures, you can see that. Cape Air would have some trouble if they went to a single engine flight meeting compliance based on those criteria. So yes, it might even be a necessary option to be able to consider for Cape Air. Next slide. Then AMA, which is the Marine Home Center airline, they run two or three Piper Navajos. Same assumptions, they're running far fewer operations. They wouldn't really have a compliance issue, but we're talking about low amplitudes, one flight Either way, it could make a difference for them. But put that on the side of no. Uh, reviewing the route again, we codified the single engine runway 24 departure for the caravan as a left turn over the top, over the airfield at greater than 2,500 feet as determined in our flight tracker. Uh, I believe that's MSL. Look at the route performance. Again, I broke down Island Air's operations by... Um, but by each, um, okay, on the left, runway 24 departures with the 402, below that runway 24 departures with the caravan, just shows the, the 402 was flying the way out west compliant route. There was no sort of cheating or trying to pretend they were a caravan and going over the top. Uh, runway 24 departures with the caravan was actually Island Air's least compliant operation and it ended up being altitude a lot of times, not hitting the required 2,500 feet, and I would mark those flights as non-compliant. And then just for your information, I broke all of these operations down by their compliance percentage, and you can see that the 2-4 caravan departure isn't doing that well. I'm getting better. I'll go through those slides Where next. Where are they going instead? They're I mean, taking a left turn over the top, but they're not reaching well. 2,500 okay. feet. Um, three examples of these non-compliant operations. Um, and while I'm going through these, keep a look at where they also cross the, the top of the island, because I'll get back to that. So here's 206, which crossed at 1,800 feet. 256 at 1,400 feet. You can see also then came back at first point, probably clearing that guy. 
289, 2100 and change. And then the next three are compliant, 2,700 feet. You also notice these are getting later into the season. I'm speculating. I know Joe's been going through new pilots and doing training. I don't know if that's a hard aeronautical maneuver to take that left turn and climb. Uh, 219 at 2,600 compliance and 289 at 2,500. At the beach, um, I'm looking for 2,500 right when crossing the South Shore. Okay, next slide. Sound monitoring. I said I wanted to do sound monitoring. I did not perform this. Um, this operation, I never traced a complaint back to it. So I didn't have a location to deploy a monitoring station. I thought about putting one out, picking a spot, but that departure track isn't uniform. You could see that the departure track would model from Bunker Road to Wong Winnet, or then on the west side from Nobodier Farm Road to First Point, and everywhere in between. This was not only because of wind, it was actual tower calls, some time to help with separation, it was pilots taking their own initiative for VFR separation, and it was Pianis runway configuration, where they were landing out on the other end. So instead of doing sound monitoring, I did sound modeling. I think I've showed some of this data before. This is from the uh, Caravan FAA certification data that covers slant range. The typical profile of those tracks when they're modeling the compliant track is 2,500 feet at the south shoreline, and they get up to about 3,600 feet sea level by the time they hit the south end of the harbor traveling north. Um, the equivalent decibel range, 57 to 64 decibels, that's down in the normal conversation range. Next slide. That's a similar range. I have slant range. I have the caravan here and then the 402 on the right. 402 flying the overwater, um, mile offshore, give or take, 1,500 feet. It's a fairly similar decibel range. Um, this would be your uh, instantaneously perceived decibel, not your DNL just or LDN. Next slide. Um, some of my own thoughts being the, the noise abatement guy. The landing fee incentive program is, oh, and these thoughts kind of guide my next suggestions, which is why I'm dwelling on them. The landing fee incentive program is really unique. It's nowhere else is there this kind of airport, airline, and resident collaboration. It's non-punitive, it's market-based. It gives the participants the ability to uh, identify and spread out compliance. And with a lot of effort, it's, it's verifiable. It's, a worthwhile thing to do. You can put these bounds and boundaries, tracks and elevations on and track them. It's also a long tenured program. I think, I think it should survive adaptation to a new concept, in this case a single engine, by the simplest modification needed. Uh, and for me it's adopting the single engine runway 24 departure, but not even all that way. You know the business case that Island Air has outlined. I'm not going to go over that. The regulations are important. It's adopting an actual FAA glide slope regulation. And it has non-additive community noise effects. Um, I propose you're not really establishing a precedent. You're adapting an existing policy to an air service evolution. Even though I use precedent again here. I should have changed that. Um, I'm so bold as to actually suggest some, some language that maybe you would want to consider. I'd suggest the commission would consider carving out a specific limited exemption, not for an airline, not for all single engine aircraft, but the most specific limited case that we have. And that being that a Cessna Grand Caravan departure from run runway 24 may be considering compliance provided that departure occurs via left turn over the top exceeding 2,500 feet MSL. Acknowledge the president, the president, the precedent, call it out. Any future route exemptions for other single engine aircraft, I don't know, maybe, maybe Cape Air will fly a Cirrus or a Pilatus. Evaluate it on a case by case basis and acknowledge that we would take into account slant range decibel levels, that this non-additive noise impact is important. Next slide. 
And reaffirm limits. We're talking about the landing fee incentive program. The landing fee incentive program is not our letter to airmen. We're not trying to go back and change this yellow text block and say, yeah, single engine VFR flights, you can do whatever you want flying over. No, we're talking about a limited exemption. It's one aircraft type operated by one company right now in just one of our noise abatement efforts. And we're talking about the landing fee incentive program, which is three operators. Um, yeah, that's the end of the presentation. I hope that wasn't too quick. Happy to answer any questions. Questions, comments? I, I think this is very good, and I appreciate both you know Noah's efforts and Island Air work together a couple of months. And I certainly, as one commissioner, support the language as suggested by NOAA. I think that meets, I hope it meets sort of the concerns of both the community as well as airline, you know, our tenants that need to operate as well. You know, I think that the process that we went through really you know, um, worked. I thank everybody, and I'll, I'll certainly support that language. Uh, Mr. Gasparo, you have some expertise, probably more than any of the rest of us, in zoning matters. Why isn't this similar to spot zoning? And if it is, is it in this context, is it bad? In, in the zoning world, it's not considered a good thing. But here, you're picking out one, one. I, I th if I may, I, I think that um, Noah's language addresses that where we're not picking a specific operator but a specific aircraft. So I think that's the distinction myself. Um, would this apply to the Pilatus? No, it only applies to the three carriers who are operating under our landing fee incentive program. I would, I would assume that if, um, let's pick on Alpha Flying, making my own assumptions, sorry here, Tom. If Alpha came to us and said, we would love to fly your VFR routes and have our landing fees reimbursed, we would look at the noise profile of the Pilatus and no, start but from there. I forget about the incentive for a moment. If a single engine operator came to us and said he would like to fly that route, would he be compliant with the with the program or not? No, he would not. He or she would not. And be why compliant. should he not be entitled to the same treatment and be treated as compliant, even though he has no incentive? I it's you know, it's still it's still a VFR flight. He still he or she still has the right to take or not take that operation. Dan, if I may, it, it's again all voluntary. The the, the incentive or the the, the carrot is the, the program. Right, I understand. Uh, but if somebody doesn't comply, they get other than these three, the, the, the disincentive for these three not to comply is very different from the disincentive from the others. The others get beaten up by Noah <laughs> for, for not. Well, that's not too much of a disincentive. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot cheaper to violate the noise, the noise standard. I understand. I understand, but I mean, the point is, should should something like this be incorporated in our voluntary noise standards for everybody? Well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just asking the question. I don't monitor the noise profile of other aircraft. You first have, like Noah says, you have to find out what the noise, the noise profile for a Pilatus, for a Pilatus is as yeah. compared to a Caravan. I, I don't know if it would be different. Maybe not. Maybe that would be something that would be extended to the... Uh, well, I, if I may, too, I, I, I think there was a little note in one of the slides that said, Tony with effort. There's a lot of effort to monitor this. If oh, we, I, I understand you know, that. I'm, I'm not... This, that I'm would just become a more than full-time job, I think. For but, I'm, but I'm trying to find out is whether there is any reason that we know of at this point to exclude other single-engine operators from this program, um, whether they be, I mean, whether they be a, a, you know, an operation for hire, so to speak, a charter operation or a, a, a private pilot, um, could we? Why wouldn't we say to them, "You're right, or right, going left and over the top at 2,500 feet"? The way we would say that to any to uh, the caravan. 
my sense is that being a voluntary program, we're trying to do the best we can. And we want to encourage overwater routes to the maximum extent possible. And knowing that these other operators in some cases may take those routes anyway, it's almost like if we go that route, then are we then promoting them? And in this particular case, we have a situation where we have regular scheduled service. So we're considering, I think, the benefits that come from that as well as it ties to the incentive program. Versus if you start to, it's almost like the old note that said single engine airplanes exempt and then it sort of opened the whole thing up to then how do you interpret that? And in this case, if we were just to leave it as it is, I think it's a best effort. So if a caravan came into the FBO, they would not be told that this was an option to make them compliant. They're, but they're, they're not, how should I say this? When we talk about compliance, there's two types of compliance. There's compliance with the voluntary routes, and then right. there's compliance for the incentive program. So for a caravan, if the language is there, it could be. We could incorporate it into the, you know, the, the NOTAM, if you will. Um, the other single engines, I'm very hesitant right now because we don't have any empirical data. We haven't done the study or the analysis mm -hmm. to say what the impacts would be for such now thing as a I just want to be sure we're treating everybody fairly. That's, that's the only reason I bring this up. Well, and, I'm not ha carrying a torch for anybody. And, and that was my concern, but again, when I look at it and I say we're talking about the incentive program only here, if you will, that's where we're, we're, we have agreements with these folks. They're part of a, an agreement that we have for the incentive program, and thereby it's in addition well, to the Well, maybe with the others we could work it so we charge them more <laughs> <laughs> to let them um, go over the top. <laughs> there, there are airports that do that. They have a penalty system. We didn't hear about this from our master planner. But, it, well, <laughs> if you want to talk about a complicated and uh, very um, labor-intensive there's very expensive yeah, no, I, under I understand that. Again, my point is I just want to be sure we're treating people fairly. I, 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 trust me, that would be one of my biggest concerns, especially with grant assurances and things. Yeah. And I, I think because of, you know, we're looking at it strictly from the incentive program, I don't think we'll have an issue at all. All right. Thank you. Any other questions mm -hmm. or comments? Um, I don't think you mentioned whether there were any complaints about this over-the-top uh, flight pattern. Uh, only very briefly. No complaints were tied back to that pattern. My only other question is why the discrepancy in the altitude? I, I, I've One of the things that I, I noticed is that there really is quite a difference between, say, 6, 1,700 feet and the 25, 2,800 feet in perceivable noise. And um, that was Maybe just Mr. Rose, why. you could address that, please. I'd be glad to. Um, as he pointed out, most of those were at the Would very you speak beginning. into the microphone? I'm sorry. Most of those were at the very beginning of the testing, and it took a little bit of time for our pilots to figure out what altitude they need to be to make the turn back in. Because they're mm -hmm. usually turning into a headwind to a tailwind. Sometimes you come back to the island faster than you expected. Mm -hmm. And that's part of it. We also noted that most of the violations were one particular pilot, and he spent a lot of time in my office. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, I guess the motion that I am asking for is one to make this uh, route permanent for caravans subject to the incentive program. Is that correct? Yeah, the proposed language that Noah had in the slide. And, well, that's there's a sep there's a separate piece of it for the yeah. other that's sort of going forward that governs going forward. As I recall, that language he proposed. Right. So I think the 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 first question is relates to our decision to in June that we would keep this uh, in place for three months, find out how it worked, and then decide whether or not to make it permanent. And that's what we're. That's what we're uh, talking about. So we're not talking now about a change now. We're talking about a, a, a an affirmation of a change that we voted in, right. in June, uh, if my interpretation is correct. And then I think we should have as a second motion 
the adoption of the policies uh, set forth by Mr. proposed policies set forth by Mr. Carberg. Sounds right. Does that make sense? Would anybody care to make one or mo both of those motions? I think uh, you might be better uh, positioned to uh, utilize the proper language, Dan. If you, if you feel I, like I will entertain a motion <laughs> to make permanent the change to the uh, departure route from runway 24 that we voted in June to permit left turns over the top 2,500 feet at 2,500 feet when they hit the shoreline to be compliant with our incentive policy. And that as applies to caravans only. And that as applies to caravans only. I'll make that motion. Is there a second? Second. All those in further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 I would now entertain a motion to adopt as policy uh, for uh, further um, um, I guess that's it really includes a number one here. Number two is the future policy that any further route exemptions for any other single engine aircraft will be evaluated on a case by case basis and may take into account slant range decibel levels. I'll make that motion as well. I'll Th second. Thank you. Is there further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carver. Thank you, Mr. Rose. Fly away. <laughs> <laughs> um, moving on. Um, consideration of granting temporary license for easement request for 30 Madikasham Valley Road. Um, this, hang on, Mr. Jensen. I'll call you on you in a minute. Uh, this came up um, last week uh, when I received a telephone call from Mr. Paul Jensen, who's here. Uh, asking that the airport consider a temporary license for an easement for a power connection, to put it in layman's terms, of a transformer, uh, with the transformer to be placed on airport land. Um, the reason it is a temporary license because the easement, uh, ultimate easement, can only be granted by town meeting. Um, and I would further state that... that uh, uh, this discussion was had with representatives of the owner and National Grid, or at least National Grid, I'm not sure about the owner per se, um, last, a year ago, a little more than a year ago. So uh, with that, unless anybody objects, I would like to call on Mr. Jensen to uh, make his case. Uh, yes, my name is Paul Jensen, and I represent the owners, um, Sharon and Jatino Dahl and they own 30 Maddox Shem Valley Road. And National Grid has proposed to put in a transformer, and they want to propose to put it in on the south side of the traveled way. And that traveled way, I have some pictures here, is on airport property. And that is closest to where the main electric line is that is in Maddox Shem. Do we have that map? Do we have but it on the slide? I have pictures here. Yeah. It's in the All right. I, I'm sorry. I thought, yeah. Okay. We have it. We yeah. know this. Um, the airport has a fence in this. This area is, I would love to hand, if I could, just approach and hand these to you. This shows you. It's a sure. GIS. Please do. Is this what you're handing out, Paul? What? Is this what you're handing out? Pretty much. Yeah, it's oh. pretty close. Okay, thank you. But it shows the Okay, property. thank you. I think you guys have that. And you can see from the map for the easement that was in your package, it shows where the easement is. It's right next to the traveled way. And I would say that this... The easement is this gray line that comes down? It's the, it's the, the wire and the little box that's there, that Up proposed here. 25 KVA 762 volt 240 pad. It's a, it's a cement pad which they put a transformer on right. top of. No, but and I that would be the ultimate easement. What we're asking this board is a temporary license while we submit a warrant article to do this. Um, the house has been mostly constructed, and I don't know, I was called a week ago. 
I don't know where they got their power, but I think it was a long electric cord to construct <laughs> the house. And they're not done with the house, but they need to get electric power. They need to get better electric power. Um, and if I, if I would hazard to say, I don't think, if you look at your GIS, the fence for the airport property is to the north of this. This traveled way is a right that all these people have. I think this area is not really airport, essential airport property, so to speak. Um, and I think in the S, you were talking earlier about how this could become part of the, this property could go into the yard sale program at some point because it is subject to a traveled way which the airport's not going to be able to shut down, and it's outside the boundaries of the usable air, and you know this is where you sell property to gain as a revenue source. Well, I'm not saying well, that are you happen. talking I'm about? Hoping. Are you talking about the land outside the paper road, or just yeah. the land in the paper road? I would say outside the paper, even outside the paper road, could happen at some point. Um, of course, you can't locate the transformer inside the paper road because. That's not allowed. So they want to have it on one side or the other. And they've, they've chosen to put it on the outside. And this is where they've submitted and done all the work. And they've laid conduit to there and everything. I believe that that property, and correct me if I'm mistaken, uh, Mr. Richardson, but it appears to me that that property is on the airport layout plan. Mr. Richardson's no, Mr. Richardson's gone. gone. Um, looking at, at our airport layout plan, and your, your photograph of the GIS, it appears that it is within the airport layout plan. Um, and therefore, a quote is, is essentially committed. Uh, yeah. Does it look that way to you, Mr. Gasparro? Yes. Oh, yeah, certainly. Yeah. Um, I guess I would raise to you the question again of why since it appears in the case of all the other houses along there that the transformers and transformer pads are on the south side of the road, why is it not feasible in your case to do that? Yeah. Well, I do not know where the transformers are for the other properties. Well, this is just by observation Yeah. By our, on our part. I, I'm a little confused with that, Dan, because I thought initially the same thing you did until I saw this um, plan. And it appears what they're proposing is the pad is on the south side of the traveled way between the paper street and the traveled way. Right, right. And all other pads are also... Well, I mean, we've also got the issue that the traveled way may be inside the ALP. It is. It is, yeah. yeah. But that parts, doesn't, parts so, of it are. Yeah. If you look closely right. on the ALP, it shows where it goes in and out. Right. But that doesn't excuse... That doesn't... No, but I guess what I'm saying, Dan, is I, I believe this is in line with where the others are as it relates to the traveled way. <clears throat> the others may not have the benefit of an easement. May not need it. Why would they not need Be it? If it's not on airport property because of the way our property... Well, what I, what I would suspect is that probably with Nantucket Electric they putting might not them in... Yeah. It didn't need it, but now with National Grid, you can't get service without the easement. So that is correct. My guess, this is, I'm just hazarding a guess, is that those transformers exist likely without the benefit without of an the, easement. Yeah, well, and I would say my my concern, if I may, sure. Mr. Chairman, is simply that now the granting of an easement is encumbering airport property. Yeah, uh, we would just get a license. This is a temporary well, license. Yeah. Until you seek an easement, that then we would have to oppose. On if we were going to take the same position, the right. easement you would be seeking from town meeting would be from the airport, right? It's airport. Or, well, uh, from know. the town of Nantucket. Well, that gets and into the care, the custody, yeah. and control, which we believe we have as it being right. outlined on the airport layout plan. I'm not trying to right. – I, I don't particularly myself see that there is a um, you know, a big harm from a, a transformer pad. My, my concern is more of – precedent that now you're, you're starting to encumber airport property with additional easements mm -hmm. that I guess I just really don't see a reason or maybe I'm missing but why the transformer can't go on the property that it serves um, 
I don't know the reason why it can't go there. I just this is what was proposed by National Grid. It may be a lot easier for them to put it in that location than other locations. I, I think that's <laughs> my sense is that's the case, and that to me isn't enough to exactly. justify encumbering airport property with an mm -hmm. e you know an additional easement. Well, if this would be a license, is this something we're going to charge for? In other words, I think well, that's a, that's a totally separate question. <laughs> 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 I mean, but before we get to the question of whether yeah. we charge for it, we have to decide whether we're going to do it at all. Well, yeah. the question is, is it? Does it encumber the property? Does it get us in, in trouble with the FAA or not? That's, I think, mm -hmm. right. that's an issue that we're talking about right now. Uh, it seems to be outside of uh, any of the critical areas here for flight path. It certainly, is not. But it is on the airport layout plan. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Correct. The question is, can we legally encumber it? Or, not? Plan. or B, can we, can we plan. sell them a license and charge for it? Well, the point is, it's town land, ultimately, and in order to get an easement, which is what they want, mm -hmm. uh, they, they have to go to town meeting and get approval. So the license would only be, presumably, if we were to grant it, would only be from now until town meeting time. Right. But and once so that's it. done, it's done, probably. That's right. The town meeting. Well, it's um, likely feasible that this could go on their own property, too. Yeah, I think I'd like to find out National Grid's reason. If it's just because it's easier or cheaper for them, I'm not for it. Well, to I the took truth. it from your note to me last week that they've actually already put the conduit in. The conduit has been put in, but I think to the, where the pad is supposed to be. Where the pad is supposed to be, and I think that was done by the homeowner on behalf the homeowner the contractor for the home put that. And is that Working. on airport but, land that well, they put it in? Well, is that for the line running into the house, or is it, it for the line running from the transformer? It's from the, from the line the for the transformer. Line, the power line to the transformer. But I think the conduit was laid. I'm not sure. I, I'm, I'm speaking without knowledge. But I think I've been told the conduit has been laid out to where to the location of the transformer pad. So they've already got it there. This despite the fact that they were told a year ago they needed an easement from town meeting. Yeah, I... Mike, if I may as well, my, my concern with granting a license at this point is then it, the presentation by the proponents at town mm -hmm. meeting is going to be the airport commission right. gave us a license yes. for this. Yeah, we have a license and, to do and, this. And now we just need an easement. So mm -hmm. I think if, yeah. if we're considering this, I, I, I you know, as one commissioner, I, I'm sympathetic to needing electric, but I don't see that us not granting this means that they can't get electric service. It probably just means some additional expense on their part to go a route that's not the easiest route. Mm -hmm. I concur with you, Mr. Bisbarro. Do we have a motion? Do we need a motion? I mean, I don't mean to be, I, I only mean in terms of, or is we, it just I a no we, action? I think we, I think we need to take it. I think we need to act on the request. <clears throat> Do we have, this is all we have? That's what we have. Along with the uh, uh, request that it be put on the agenda, there's a proposed license that was forwarded with it, and that uh, w as part of this, we would pay for the town council to review the license. We're happy to do that, um, and I think town council has looked at the license, made one comment about insurance, which we're happy to provide also. Um, it's a temporary license by its terms that expires if we do not get. Mm -hmm. Town meeting the approval. one thing, frankly, yeah. Mr. Jensen, that I didn't think of when we spoke last week and that others have greater expertise than perhaps town council has and the grant assurances that we give the FAA and the Massachusetts Department of Transportation, that I can't see our agreeing to this under any circumstances without running it by somebody who knows whether it would be in compliance with those grant assurances. Mm -hmm. And I apologize for that, but I didn't think of it at the time. Um, I, in fact, I, I frankly wasn't aware exactly where the property was. Madagascan Valley Road sort of winds around. and um, So um, I'm, I'm going to vote against uh, granting the license. Um, when it comes to that, uh, for that reason alone, at this point, although I am I am somewhat dismayed at the fact that uh, you know 
and I'm not sure it's the homeowner's fault or your client's fault, but that they were on notice a year ago as to what was required and could have done it in time for last year's town meeting and uh, didn't. So um, anyway, is there a mo does somebody want to make a motion? To make a motion to deny the request for a license uh, to put this uh, national grid transformer transformer on the, on the property where it's specified. I'll second and that. So we can further clarify the location mm -hmm. and, and right. our ability to even grant this. I'll second that. So are there further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Jensen. Uh, Mr. Jensen, um, I'm not sure that the outcome would be any different, uh, but if you want us to explore further with respect to the grant assurances um, after you consult with your client, let us know. Yeah, I'll consult with my client. I also am going to try to consult with National Grid to find out if we can move this onto the property because it would be a lot easier for my client to grant their own easement. Right. For this. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Tom. All right. Um, pending leases and contracts. Okay. We've got a number of service contracts. Uh, Hortonville Consulting is an additional $540 for amendment number one to increase. Uh, it's an increase to cover the national incident management system trainings that we're required to have. And, uh, Commissioners and administrative staff are required to have it. Door concepts for $1,740.55 to repair the automatic doors for the terminal. E&E systems for $5,338 to repairs to the geothermal system. Kobo Utility Construction Company, $523 to repair the uh, 624 edge light radio control system. And a Vegetation Control Services, Inc. Uh, was a bid came in at $29,845. That's for the required brush cutting of 55 acres, and it came in below budget. The Weisentainer amendment is still pending, or the abatement. Are they uh, paying rent at the full rate or at the abated rate? Weisentainer? Yes. They're paying at the full rate right, right now, I believe. Um, are there any questions on these contracts? Is there a motion to approve all of the uh, contracts and the contract amendment with Hortonville Consulting? I'll make that motion. A second. second. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Um, the Mass DOT grant award. I wish I could say this is fairly straightforward, but it's a little unique in that w they mix the uh, tools and equipment from the f for the fire truck with the snow blower under an AIP grant number 63, and this is the state match of $40,200. And it will be on the Board of Selectmen agenda for October 28th. And we need to approve it, and we need to approve the... <coughs> and the accept the grant assurances. Accept yes. the grant assurances once again. I'll make a motion to accept the uh, MassDOT uh, grant award and associated grant assurances, uh, AIP number 63. I'll second that. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Um, thank you very much. Um, the CIP. Uh, Noah and I met with the FAA last Monday on the CIP, which is in your packet. And the general concept that we were looking at was to perform the environmental EA, EIR, when, it, when other projects that were requiring that environmental work were, were ready to go, meaning we, the EA, EIR has about a five-year shelf life. I didn't want to complete the environmental work and then not have any projects ready to go right behind it, have it expire and have to redo it again. So as Bill stated earlier, what we're doing is we're doing projects that don't require the environmental, although there are two that, one that may, <coughs> and possibly two. The one that uh, would require it is the employee housing and the Sun Island Road may require it. We did get confirmation from the FAA, though, that if we did that, 
and they became part of the overall EA EIR, they would be reimbursable at the time that we did the EA EIR. So the general focus is performing the activities that don't necessarily require the large scale environmental, then we'll be doing the environmental and continuing some of that apron rehabilitation and other things, but um, right behind it would be the new projects that Phil uh, identified. And the FAA's theory is always to work from the runway out. So the high speed exit taxiway would probably be a priority there. And as Bill also mentioned, there's a lot of um, decisions that are being worked through on this overall geometry issue, which may require us to relocate these stub taxiways and offset them. So we're going to let that play out on a national level while we accomplish some other work that doesn't require that. And then by then we should hopefully have an idea, a better idea of where this goes. Understand that this um, capital improvement plan is updated on an annual basis. It's for a five-year term, but it's updated every year. And this goes into what is known as the airport capital improvement plan, which is the nationwide one, and they're in the process of revising that and consolidating it with the NIPIAS, believe it or not. So um, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Um, there were, there was just one minor thing, a, a small, I don't know, amount of money that they had a difference, FA and the consultant had a difference, and they were going to reconcile that. It was very nominal, though. Um, so in year five, um, there's FAA discretionary money? Yes. For the, and again, discretionary money, you have to understand we compete with the entire country, and the high priority projects are safety and capacity related. Mm -hmm. So that's why we have the uh, run up pads and stub taxiway relocation geometry issues. And why year five and not year any of the other years? A again, we're we have to do the environmental first. Okay, okay. So the environmental is kind of driving any of the new stuff. Mm -hmm. Do some of the existing, do the environmental, and then do the new pavement. And there was a recommendation I'm trying to see that we may have to go do a mini planning analysis for some of that too. But they said they would we'd wait till next year to evaluate that. Do we need a vote to adopt this? I don't believe so. No, it's um, it's not that they approve it or anything. Yeah. It's, well, it's just a working a working document right. basically. Yes. Yeah, okay. And um, I'm sure you've probably all heard that the federal government is on a temporary extension. Um, so that could impact our grant timing this year. Uh, they've been given six months continuing resolution and wait and see what happens then. But uh, that may impact when we get our grants and when we're able to do some of these projects. Uh, the, any other questions on the CIP or mm -hmm. can I move on to the the capital? I, I We may need action on this, Dan. The commission adopted a draft of our capital request, and I had to update that slightly. We did pull out the beads and uh, paint, put that into the operating, but we made some minor modifications. I think we brought over the, the paint sprayer and... Um, it's less than what was proposed, but you'll see in your packet there's a different format. The town is, uh, they purchased some software, and they're going to be inputting very high-level detail. This is the first year, so they're building on it. Uh, I have to expand even what is in your packet a little bit further. The other question that need needs to be answered for each one of these is the impact on the operating, if any, whether it will be additional cost, cost savings, or that type of thing. And what you see in your packet is just one of many tabs that we forwarded to the town where if on this spreadsheet where it references a plan such as a CIP, I attach the CIP, where it references the master plan, I have to cut out and show the sections of the master plan. Um, any cost estimates, 
we, we attached all those. Johnny and his crew did a great job in operations in getting us written quotes so that these are not just guesstimates. They're doing their due diligence. They don't want people to come in and just say, well, we think it's going to be $30,000 when it's a $5,000 item. So we attached all those. We also attached pictures of all of them so that when um, the capital committee or FinCom get it, they understand exactly what the project is. They can get a, a sense of what we're talking about. So um, I Just apologize. We had to update it, but sorry. it's, you know. On these poles and lights? Yes. From 2009, what are they made of? Tin foil? They're, no, they're, <laughs> they're currently steel, and the uh, new ones will be fiberglass. Mm -hmm. And again, I apologize that the, 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 the file was so big we had to put it onto a, um, a disc and take it down to town. But the, the existing ones are rusting and rotted and in dangerous condition. Mm -hmm. The new ones will be fiberglass and LED uh, light heads mm -hmm. on top of them, so it will be energy efficient as well. And we have such a salt co content in the air, because I know when Jack was the electric company, he had to do, do a lot of replacement of different wi wires and things like that because of the salt that uh, just yeah, again, deteriorates them. I, we have the color pictures that show the rust and deterioration yeah. of the base, the pole, everything. So. Amazing. I, and along that, I'm just wondering, though, you know, we have more poles than just these. Should we be looking at some PM, some preventive maintenance on those, some yes. sanding and painting? And I mean, some some we have are already converted, actually, because Johnny showed us a picture of the, some of the newer ones. Yeah. Uh, okay. These are old ones around the fuel farm. I just have one yes. question, comment, if I may. I'm, I'm just thinking about the bottom line. You know, and we were looking at, say, a bit over a, a half a million dollars next year, and I, the piece of this that we don't have, I, I support the projects, but I'm just thinking about our budget and thinking about how, where we don't have the budget in front of us as well, and if you could just give us a little, I, are you comfortable? Is this, is, well, this is a project, these are capital projects, so they will be, the, our portion will be funded through borrowings, right? Yes, so and that's, that's where, debt service. Debt and, service. and there was a little confusion, um, and I can take you through the numbers at the bottom where the grand total of $2,021,000 is for all projects what we estimate the cost to be. Of that, 1.55 is eligible for FAA funding. <clears throat> Doesn't mean we're going to get that ourselves. So the next part is responsible, act responsible is us for the, um, th there's 471 is the difference then that we fully have to take responsibility for plus the AIP portion of the eligible. So of that 1.55 million, we have to put up the sponsor the share 5%, of 5%. 5%, 5 so yeah. that's 77,000. Yeah. So long-term bonding, we'll have to do the 471 and the 77, which mm -hmm. is the 548. The other will be a short-term ban because we'll be getting reimbursement for that. Mm -hmm. And your work, I just want to be sure before we approve this, we're comfortable that the Payments on that debt service is right. Right. Current, overly, current overly interest rates burden. is about fifteen thousand dollars a year, and so we look around five hundred thousand to be. We had a much bigger one. Mm -hmm. We just had to cut it down to get into the five hundred thousand range for the debt service. It's about fifteen thousand dollars a year of interest plus plus uh, the um, principal repayments. Right, and I believe next yeah, year we have something going off too. So we're yeah, we're, mm -hmm. that's one of our first checks. It's a little out of order in my mind. I usually do an operating and then go to capital for what you have. Um, Tom, you might just take a moment and talk about our meeting with Mary Walsh because of, I, in the con in context of employee okay. housing. Okay, yeah. Um, employee housing, we met with Mary Walsh and Jorge Pantelli from the FA and they provided us with some guidance and suggestions on um, how we may accomplish that, and we're I'm working towards developing the the necessary plan that they've uh, suggested. So we'll be discussing that further later. But there's some uh, there were some opportunities, as they put it, to to possibly do this so to move forward, right? To move forward, um, part of that would be trying to get an order of magnitude cost so that we can then the, the hundred thousand that's in there right now is a placeholder. But then the commission could make a determination as to, you know, what possible mechanisms they want to use to fund the, the employee housing. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. Um, Town meeting articles? Yes. Oh, I think we, we should. We need a vote, vote on this. We want to vote on this to on the capital, accept yeah. the form, final capital plan. Is there a motion to do so? I'll make that motion. Thank you. Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 The town meeting articles um, are due in shortly. We have our standard uh, budget capital operating revolving account. Uh, one that we're going to be proposing is a lo uh, requesting long-term leases for the Sun Island Road property so that when we issue that request for proposal, we can uh, allow long-term leases there. And I think there's one other, but I can't remember off the top of my head what exactly it was. I have it in my computer. Uh, ones that are not typical or, you know, standard ones. If you have any thoughts or ideas that we may need anything, um, I'll need to know that as well. One other item, the, the FinCom schedule, January 11th, they're going to be discussing revolving funds, and January 25th is the airport budget. And we meet with... January 25th? January 25th. At the end of November, uh, Jamie and I will be meeting with Libby regarding the airport budget, and we're working internally. Uh, Jamie has issued the packets, and we're, she's already started the process of putting that budget together. Questions? Should I move on to the manager's report? Please. On the project side of the house, the North Apron Rehab is underway. The paving has uh, begun. It's about two-thirds done in the first lift. During some excavation work, they hit a geothermal line, disrupted the system temporarily, but they made all the repairs and uh, have fixed that system. The schedule, I believe they're either on or ahead of schedule. They're moving quite rapidly, and then the weather delayed them a little bit, but I believe they're going to be ahead of schedule on that. The air traffic control tower, uh, the mobilization has begun. There's a slight delay. The controllers will not be moving out of the existing control tower until the evening of October 14th. October 15th is when the mobile control tower will be up, and the contractor can get in and begin some heavy demolition uh, work. We're also still working through some challenges with the town regarding the use of a clerk of the works and the OPM and until such time as that's completely resolved David Sylvia is our clerk of the works on the project and is David uh, is David Thank Sylvia you. yes and I, I as I mentioned um, in the GA project we had a number of people named Jeff in this project we have a number of people named Dave <laughs> so we have Airport Dave, which is Dave Sylvia. We have Construction Dave, which is Dave Coppola, the superintendent for the contractor. We have Owner Dave, which is Dave Marin. And we have Engineering Dave. So if somebody says Dave in that project meeting, everybody looks. The parking lot, I, I'm going to knock on wood. I have good news report. It was supposed to be done by the beginning of summer, but the company, remember, had to ship it from Germany and so on. The exit housing is up and fully operational. It was as of this afternoon. <laughs> um, so we're, we're back in business for that. And I, I have to congratulate um, Robbie Townsend, who did a great job in staying after the company and, and not only staying after them, but telling them we're not paying for poor service and you to come out here three times. So we did not pay for, we, we paid for exactly what, you know, we ordered, not what they gave us. I'll leave it at that. The taxiway markings program. The state is going to be doing that again this year. You may recall I mentioned that. Um, it was possibly going to begin next Monday, but now it could be this week. It depends if they got a boat reservation or not. So <laughs> the good news is they're, they're performing that. It's going to save us again a big chunk of change. And it sounds like they may have that funded again for next year. They're telling us it was iffy. Um, so that, again, would help us on that operating side where we had to bud budget the 135000 for paint and beads. On the RFQ, RFP update, um, <clears throat> we received another formal objection letter from Team Eagle contesting the snow removal equipment bid. This time they, and I spoke to them before I got this letter, I told them I need very specifics, how they're, you know, what they're contesting, and they provided us with that, so I'm going to be meeting with the engineer to review it and see if, in fact, uh, 
we think they have a legal case, we're going to have to look at that, whether or not we uh, continue to accept the uh, low bidder and determine whether or not it was responsible. We're, uh, Janine has been working very diligently on an RFP for the clerk of the works and is, uh, yeah, working through some issues with that one. Also, Janine's been working on the rental car request for proposals that's drafted and the beads, glass beads that we did put out for bid, the bids are due in um, on the 22nd, was it? On the uh, operations side of the house, you may recall that there was a derelict Cessna 402 on the airport, had no engines, and then the rudder was damaged, destroyed, and then there was blue tarp around it. And, uh, that has been removed off the airport. Not far, but it's off the airport. It's over the fence, and we told them we're not going to allow derelict airplanes to remain on the airport. So. Another note, Wiggins operation has been relocated. That's the FedEx and UPS aircraft. They've been moved down to the um, area where Marine Home Center was prior to moving into the hangar. That seems to be working well, opens up a lot of space. I think it's a lot safer and better maneuver. The first quarter financial report will be given to the Board of Selectmen on November 18th. We just don't even have a draft out yet, so as soon as we get it, we'll have it to the Commission for the next meeting. Uh, in your handout tonight, too, I put together something that uh, Libby had asked for through the, the Board of Selectmen through Libby had asked for some summer indicators to see how the summer was. So we put together some basics on uh, fuel, gallons sold, revenue, some explanations. And you'll see that, as I've told you before, the fuel gallons sold are up. The uh, revenue is down, but the profit is up and our uh, revenues from the GA side of the house on ramp and landing fees and FBO type things are up. So uh, I thank Noah and Jamie for preparing that. On the solar initiative, the town uh, apparently has identified some interested party or parties that may have an interest in solar. And again, if they proceed with it, we would enter into some sort of a lease arrangement for the land for that. We're also working with um, the PLUS Department planning land use regarding some parcels that they think there's already been approval to transfer to the airport and it's just taking a final action now for the Board of Selectmen to uh, approve that. Does, does this include some of the ones they've tried to sell? I don't believe so, no. This is <laughs> primarily down in the approach to 6 area, and I, I mentioned also the one down by the um, uh, Sandy Roberts property, the former Divine property, where the fence kind of bifurcates the, the piece of land. So the fact that they're acknowledging that there's already been approval and that process has started, so it's a good thing. Mr. Uh, on that topic? Yes. If I may, I saw today in the planning board packet a uh, drawing associated with those potential warrant articles and it gives they're, me some concern. They're not warrant articles. <clears throat> These are, the, according to Andrew, the ones that he's talking about are already done. Um, oh, I'm sorry, but okay, I, there, I were, there, there are other I, warrant I articles it to you, them. So you may not have had a chance to see your email yet. It was just this okay. afternoon. But the, what I want to raise is that on this sketch done by Andrew, it proposes transferring a parcel of land to the land bank, which is shown on our ALP. As ours? Well, I'm right here, I'm looking at this plan, and he has it highlighted on the sketch that I sent to you, and it's the portion of land that is outside of the fence that may have been part of an article one of the last couple of years as part of what happened with the whole right. situation down there. I just thought it would be best to bring your attention I, early. I'll double check that because I I went through so each one of those. He's looking at, according to this sketch, this part of those two parcels that's inside of the fence comes to the airport and the part that's outside of the fence goes to the land bank. But in my mind, if it's on the ALP. Okay, it, it is that piece you're talking about where the fence goes through? Yeah. Okay, I'll look at that one. And, and it's a very rough sketch. It's, it's highlighter marker, mm. but if they're going <laughs> to discuss it at a planning board meeting on Thursday, this is the time, I would say, to be sure that we're protecting the airport's interests. 
I don't see why or you know I wouldn't want to see authorization go through or even the ball starting to roll in that direction okay if it's on the ALP and where are the ones that, that Andrew Morris is talking about that the plus there over in here there, there's two big chunks right in here and again it's, it's simply right now down in Nantucket coming over to the airport mm -hmm. so it's that and then the one that Arthur said is there right in here. Yeah. and where is this that you think is on the um, can you it's going to be at the planning board can you pull up the ALP Dave mm. sorry you just had it up. <laughs> okay. So if you want to, can you zoom or? Well, no, or, it's well it's so it's that this parcel. Right in here. Right. You can see where the fence goes along. It kind of mm -hmm. doesn't quite bifurcate, but it does the gem about two thirds. And, and the you're saying this piece here, they want to give to the land. That's right. right. Which what? is where they created that walkway. That's right. Okay. The other <laughs> parcels were over in this area, and they were again just identified as town and tuck it near to be transferred to the airport. And that's going to be done by the Board of Selectmen, did you say, Mr. Rector? The, the ones that are already approved, but I think the one that Arthur's saying there are uh, some the, proposed we discussed by the planning board. Yeah. transferring land. So I'll look at that. Their meeting's Thursday night? That's right. Yeah. Which I think is a preliminary discussion, but... No, it's... It's always good to find out what's happening. Right. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for that, Mr. Sparrow. Could one of us attend that meeting? Or, uh, I'll be there for business anyway. Okay. okay. Ready for statistics? Yes, sir. And again, we have uh, in here later will be the, these are the August statistics, but we do have September fuel. The operations uh, down 6% roughly for August, about 0.34 year to date. And the employments also continue to decline. They're down about 6.3%, um, and then year to date down 4.8. You'll see, okay, good. I added something that may not be in your handout. Um, this table, we did a comparison of operations to employments and uh, looked at, you know, trying to identify who's what's happening exactly now this is just for the month of August and you can see Cape Air's operations were up 5% their employments were up 8% uh, United down 40 in operations but 43 in employment so uh, I didn't want to just show the employments or the operations so we're looking to see although they may have cut back in flights that's impacting the what the, the drop is as well. So the average load factors may still be strong. And in your, um, in the, well, we can go to the next one, Dave. These are new slides I asked Dave to put together and we're, we're still refining it because we took this from another airport. I thought it was a decent format. I got to look because it's now showing 15 before 14. We might want to show it the other way around. But this is by market, so this is Boston showing Cape Air and JetBlue, and it shows you the employments, number of flights, the average passengers per flight, and their load factor, and then the change, uh, percentage change of employment. So it gives you a good idea of the, the strength, if you will, of the various markets and what they're doing. It, it's a slight indicator, and I, sa I shouldn't say a slight indicator, it's a decent indicator, however, you have to understand when you look at the strength of the market, uh, an average load factor, you know, you, you obviously want a high load factor. You can see an 85% in August for JetBlue going DCA. That's a good load factor. However, we don't know exactly what the break-even load factor there is, and that means they may be charging um, a high ticket price and therefore only need to fill 
60 of the 100 seats. So you, you always look at the break-even load factor. Typically, on a larger airplane like that, it's probably in the 60-some range. So the 40% wasn't good, 51. Uh, but again, it was the first year for DCA service for JetBlue. But they so we knocked it bit out of U.S. Air's market. Right. It took some of the U.S. Air market um, as well. I'm, I'm just very intrigued, just to go back to Boston for a moment, that um, um, JetBlue's Boston route was down in percentage-wise. Right. Wise. It went down. Whereas Cape Air's went up dramatically for the first time in quite some time. Right. And it's again, if you remember, they had 20-plus flights in that market. Right. So. Yeah. That's true. But um, you will see in one of these charts that there was there's no price sensitivity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the average. Uh, no, that's the employment change. There was a load factor that was in excess of 100 mm -hmm. percent. I think it's on the last one. And the reason was the. Uh, and I called Dave, and I, he keeps reminding me. I said, Dave, how can we have a load factor over 100 percent? I said, What are they sitting on the wings? Or <laughs> it was a uh, different size aircraft. So we had that just, we took an average, and that's mm -hmm. what happened. They were flying 50 N70 seat airplanes. We used the 50. So, again, it, it's just additional information that, um, you know, as we start to look at the various markets and who's flying what and trying to make sure that the airlines are still healthy, these are the things that we're going to be looking at. <coughs> Didn't U.S. Air used to fly to Newark, too, from here? At one point, I think, years ago, maybe, yeah. Was it Newark? Was it LaGuardia, and they did Philadelphia, too, from what I heard. Yeah, they, did, they did Newark as well. And, uh, one of my efforts, I have a meeting with American, who's now U.S. Air, or U.S. Air, now American. I have a meeting with them, United and Cape Air, um, when I go to the speed dating conference. And the presentation that we're preparing is trying to convince them to look into the Philadelphia market as well as expand their season uh, that they have here. On the, on the DCA. As I mentioned, the um, the fuel, this is for August. Uh, it was down 4.6, but year-to-date up 4.1 for jet fuel. However, in September, if you go to the next one, I think it is, okay, this is Avgas, <coughs> up slightly for August, down year-to-date, but September changed things around. Um, oh, freight, I'm sorry, freight's still down. Do you have the September fuel? Oh, yeah. I thought I sent it back to you. The jet fuel was up 18% in September, uh, so it offset the, the drop in August, um, and Avgas was also up. So, uh, and I dare say that we're probably going to see hopefully some decent numbers for October because yes, yesterday it seemed like a Sunday in August out mm -hmm. there. We were having issues trying to find places to park airplanes and things. So. Noise complaints are down to 55 from 61, and Noah has the explanation for each of the uh, groups there. All right. Yeah. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, personnel report? Uh, one um, item on the personnel report, you may remember, we made an organizational change where um, instead of replacing the FBO superintendent, we made it an FBO supervisor, and the FBO will be under the operations superintendent's uh, functions and responsibilities. So I uh, propose increasing uh, the operations superintendent's salary slightly. It's a few thousand dollars up to... Uh, the same as the maintenance superintendent. So we have two superintendents, and then we ha will have a supervisor under each for maintenance, operations, and FBO. Is the net cost going to be uh, up, down, or the same? Net is less. All right. Any qu further questions? Mm -mm. Commissioner's comments? I have a question. Uh, when I travel to um, New York, do they have an intercoms on the TSA area for them to tell you about boarding your airplane? Or do they not use it? Uh, that's part of the FIDS pro project that we're doing in the PA system, also known as an emergency notification system. Mm -hmm. um, we have one, and I think they may have access to it. 
but it's through phone lines, which is a very poor way to go, and you, n nine out of ten times you can't hear it. So it, it's very, very poor. We've had, I see, who's here? I haven't used it. I haven't <laughs> Am heard I after you I again? Haven't, <laughs> I haven't heard them use it in months now. He's been extremely patient. He's been asking for it for probably two years now at least. Um, it's, it's in the plan. We're getting the funding for it, and we're talking about the scope of it within the next few weeks. So um, the, the, system that, the, the systems that are out there that are better than we have are dedicated systems. They're not on a phone line. You have a separate microphone. You can zone them accordingly so that, you know, you can do announcements in baggage claim in the secure hold room. And they also adjust the ambient noise levels so that if it's crowded, it'll automatically raise the volume in that area. Well, so it was very chaotic. Because the, the whole system, nobody knew where they were going. They couldn't hear what row she was calling or anything like that. And I mentioned, don't you have a microphone? And, or you know, and, No, she didn't, she told me. So I thought, okay, I thought we had one. <laughs> so there, there is something in there, but it's... Um, not very good. It's not, not used. Good. Not used. No, well, this was not used. And even when they try to use it, it's not so good. So. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? It just two, two things. One was just in response to the manager's report. He mentioned removal of the derelict airplane, and I'm just wondering about derelict cars as well. I know that I'm wrong on the whole airport property. There's we're we're working on that. Um, the town has some similar challenges because of the the laws and legal ramifications. We put them in a, as you know, a, a holding okay. pen. Uh, believe it or not, I think since you brought this up a few months ago, we actually had somebody come and claim one of them. Um, but our actions are limited as to what we can do, even with public notice and things, um, because of the way the rules are right now. The police department has similar issues with other vehicles throughout town, and they're working on changing that. So so I, I do know that for town, for uh, annual town meeting, there will be a warrant article that has to do with the abandoned vehicles as well. Okay. Um, so I guess if that's our holdup, I thought maybe we were under a slightly different situation. If someone just leaves their car, anyway, it sounds like it's on your radar and you're working on it. That was all. My point is, if we're going to make someone get rid of a derelict airplane, I would think we'll push we wouldn't just cars leave too. abandoned cars <laughs> too. Well, the way we did the derelict airplane was the rate went up daily because we had the ability to do that in our rules and regulations. You see. Um, and the one other thing I just wanted to inform the commission was I attended uh, the minute training session that was put on by town council and um, basically oh, right. yeah. made it glaringly clear that Janine's doing everything perfectly <laughs> and that we have, you know, a great system. The, the commission in 2011 had adopted a policy that I think helped set everything on the kind mm -hmm. of the right track and that um, I, as the person who has been taking executive mission, Executive session minutes have not been doing everything perfectly, <laughs> and I will work Could to improve me. <laughs> my process. Well, the one the one piece is the list of documents used, right. and council made it very clear that that is where most uh, minute takers fall down, if you will. Is that it's very important that you know you see on all of our minutes she's always yeah. very good, and, right. and I haven't been, and we maybe don't always use very many documents, but I just have to be. And then we that. have to have a system for making sure where they're kept and that when we ultimately release the minutes, they're part of it. Right. But it was okay. uh, it was nice to see the town using, you know, I know part of town council's contract, a lot, you know, provides for them to do a certain amount of training. So the citizen side of me, I was encouraged by that as well. And it was, I, I thought it was, it was good. I mean, there was a ton of questions. It went the whole couple hours. So well, thank you for all. going. I, no, I was happy to, especially taking the minute. I, yeah. I, I, it was informative. Yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. Anything else? I've got a couple of things. Okay, I, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. You brought up the pl airplane. Was there a cost to that, or how, how who handled it? Uh, I guess uh, I'm more curious about what. <laughs> <laughs> you know me and the dollars. <laughs> well, and the dollar, we're we're not going to be collecting a minimal tie down that they were paying, but again, <laughs> it's worth the eye sort of be gone. No, co we. The only Your, thing our own people do is did it, did they? Pardon me? Did our own people no. do it? No. Okay. Nope. okay. They were, the individual that owned the aircraft was put on notice that the fees were going to be increasing, and they would be increasing on a regular basis until that airplane was removed. Okay, thank and you. It was removed. 
And to add to what Mr. Gasparro was saying, that I was just re attended a meeting, and the uh, facilitator indicated how great that meeting was uh, for the minutes and everything, and same kind of things, a few things that she needed to find out to do. But and most of it was to go into the executive session. We, I told her how what we do, right? You know, to reading them everything. So, but anyhow. Um, I uh, I don't know whether you saw it, but in the paper and then in a subsequent newspaper article, which Mr. Gasparro was kind enough to send me, um, there is an announcement of a, an application by C Street, the fast ferry company, uh, that uh, already has service from New Bedford to uh, the vineyard and from New York to the vineyard. It's put in an application for service from um, New Bedford to Nantucket. <coughs> and... Um, I think this is another threat, albeit a small one, uh, to the health of the airlines who are um, who serve us, and, and this is a threat, frankly, to the New Bedford Airport. Um, but um, you know, I'm not going to propose that we say anything. Uh, it got sort of beaten down the last time I tried that. Uh, but there is a hearing here on the island on the 26th of uh, October. If anybody's interested in attending, I think I will attend just to see what what goes on. Um, where would that take place? Yeah. I can't, off the top of my head, tell you where it is. Do uh, they meet at the Whaling Museum? I think they often do. I but, think so. Yeah. I'm not positive, but that's I think where they. They have a room in the terminal where they're supposed to meet, but they never meet up there. Um, I, I'll find out and let you know. Um, but. Uh, you know, I, I just think it's an interesting uh, turn of events, and um, I uh, will uh, watch with interest. Now, somebody told me today that we should partner with the airline in promoting the service to New Bedford, um, and because it it's an easy promotion in the sense that you miss the Cape and so on. Uh, and I just, I don't have an opinion on that, but I just pa wanted to pass it on. Um, the other comment that somebody made to me today was, you know, that uh, with the fast ferries, technology of the fast ferries has overtaken the technologies of the small airplane. And um, um, again, I, I just pass that on as an observation. Um, uh, just uh, my other point is that I will not be present physically at the next meeting. I will be participating remotely. Is there public comment at this time? Hearing none, I will entertain a motion to go to in, into executive session uh, to uh, review the executive session minutes of all those dates listed on the agenda. Is that all right? Does that satisfy the yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> for possible release and of uh, September eighth, two thousand fifteen, for review and possible release, and under clause six to consider the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property with respect to Exhibit A, the chair has determined that an open session may have a detrimental effect on the negotiation position of the airport commission, and. Uh, to consider the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of property and discuss pending litigation to town versus the Gatto versus the town. The chair has determined that an open session may have a detrimental effect on the negotiation and or litigation position of the airport commission. Is there such a motion not to return to open session? I'll make that motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Aye. Ms. Aye. Aye. Mr. Muscarin? Aye. Ms. Planzer? Aye. Mr. Gasparro? Aye. aye. And the chair votes aye. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, uh, Ms. Torres, for <laughs> keeping me straight and honest. Okay.
all that shuts down and restart it for me, I'll have them do their signing. And then I'll check it.
no, not necessarily. to go to earthchannel.com or into the town's website first. Sometimes it's easy to go to the town's website and see if it's actually running. Yeah. Oh, so wrong. 